with CBiz. I'm an uh, executive well-being consultant here, and we're so pleased to be uh, with you today. Uh, joining me today is Paul Beck, Senior Risk Consultant at CBiz Insurance Services. And we're going to cover a topic today that hopefully will be of, of, of interest, and we know it's of value uh, because we've seen it uh, really work well in, in many organizations. Uh, and so we really want to share some thoughts to you, maybe, maybe a little bit different than what you've been exposed to in the past, and uh, also want to hear from you and some of the things that are related to what you're doing in the area of, of safety and well-being. Uh, so we're going to get started uh, immediately here. Uh, I'll just turn it over to Paul, and he'll kick us off and kind of go through our objectives, and and uh, we'll, we'll we'll have time for our questions all through the the uh, presentation. So we just uh, send a note there through the chat, and we'll uh, respond to your questions as we go through. So very very informal conversation today with all of you, but thanks for joining us. So Paul, go ahead and and um, take it away. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for attending. Uh, as, we, as Jack just alluded to in the introduction, our, our objective today really is to inspire you uh, to think differently as you might be approaching uh, the important objective of creating uh, and promoting a safe and healthy workplace. Um, and I know we recognize that as much as we, uh, in the, the space we work in, advocate for uh, a combined approach or front for safety and wellness. Uh, within organizations we work with and interact with, uh, it's not as common as we'd expect. Uh, and, and as workplace wellness programs uh, begin to grow to encompass a broader approach to employee well-being, so more than just uh, in, uh, wellness, but, but overall uh, financial success or financial well-being, uh, mental well-being, health well-being, uh, we believe it's even more important to leverage and collaborate with your occupational health and safety team uh, to impact those behaviors and the environments that they work in that contribute to both the personal health risks um, as well as, as your, your occupational health risks. So, so why well-being and safety? Um, uh, throughout the presentation today, I, I will be comparing and contrasting the different perspectives uh, and barriers uh, that each discipline encounters with respect to the integration uh, of safety and wellness efforts um, and make the case for implementing a combined front within your organization. Um, so to us, it's no longer a question of whether the commitment to wellness and safety will produce a viable return on investment. I think that's been proven in a lot of the case studies we see and a lot of the successes we see within organizations. but. Between the studies that have been published and, and all the data we have available on health interventions and their impact on reducing risk factors, uh, a better question might be how do you maximize the value of your investment? So no focus on return on investment, but how do you maximize the value? Uh, there will be a couple of studies, two in particular we're going to highlight today. Uh, one study recognizes uh, the lack of attention to uh, focusing on the commonalities between what we traditionally view as occupational risk factors or quote unquote those of responsibilities of the employer uh, and, and personal risk factors which we traditionally think are responsibilities of each person. Um, another study we, we review or we're going to review today uh, makes a strong business case for employers who have developed these best practices in wellness and safety uh, and talk about the impact it's had on their overall profitability. Uh, the more we look into the data and the research, uh, the clearer it becomes that the risk factors for occupational and health and personal health are often the same. And if this is true, why are we not seeing uh, uh, more focus on this uh, and the combined efforts impact these risk factors in the organization? That's the big question. Uh, a couple other reasons why well-being and safety. Well, combining both efforts are going to give you a good task, uniform goals and objectives. Um, so in addition to the cost benefits of implementing the combined initiative, uh, it's understanding that both wellness and safety have, have in most part different overall responsibilities. So wellness has its own set, safety objectives have their own set, but they share common goals and objectives. So finding that common ground that supports each, uh, each other's efforts uh, and strengthens that, that value to the organization uh, can help avoid conflict of interest. Uh, second, lever leveraging and maximizing resources. So, 
you know, it's important to most efficiently and effectively utilize budget allocations to execute your plan. We, we all understand that. And considering that both initiatives are typically focused on the same employee, combining these efforts can maximize these resources that are available to you through your organization uh, and, and being able to leverage those funds. Because the reality is the, the safety and the wellness functions within the organization are not profit centers, typically expense. So it's oftentimes difficult Unless there's some problems, it's always difficult usually to leverage things that haven't occurred because you guys are on the prevention side. Uh, a third is uh, a collaboration, of course, working together to prove better results than competing against each other for resources and, and, and all, uh, other objectives. And it really provides opportunities to share between both of these uh, areas what's working and what's not, so learning from each other on what's successful on the safety side, maybe on that side on the wellness side. Uh, a fourth is consistent measurements. Uh, those who deal with safety every day uh, often look at injury data. Uh, they evaluate environmental conditions in their workplace. Um, sometimes they take surveys, perception surveys, or uh, get some feedback from their employees on making decisions. Wellness data often utilizes participation statistics. So we here's a program, how many people are involved, what's the success rate. Uh, they review aggregate health trends out in, uh, internally and out against benchmarks against the field, uh, among a bunch of other metrics. And finding a way to blend these, this information that's available uh, can really help develop a more direct solution that uh, can lead to better intervention. And then finally, a consistent message, right? We want uh, fundamental differences, I think, between safety and wellness is that safety is mandatory, right? It's a lot of compliance, uh, a lot of, of rules that you have to follow, regulations uh, that you build your uh, that you build your safety programs on. And, and wellness, you find, is often a little bit more voluntary. So here's something we'd like you to do. So it's finding ways to, to blend that message uh, and, and get people on board, get people to buy it, uh, and, and get the cooperation from the employees that you desire so that you can uh, in over, impact your overall culture of the safety and wellness. Uh, so since, since Jack and I are talking from two different sides, uh, my, my uh, discipline being in the safety and health side and then Jack having expertise in the wellness, I, I'd like to take a you know, step back for a second and look at it from a safety perspective. And for those of you on the call that, that have safety duties, you know that a lot of the way safety has been structured in organizations is all about uh, focusing first and foremost on compliance. So it's safety health, keeping workers from getting injured and, and, and getting ill from the type of work they do. But a lot of it's based on things like OSHA. Uh, maybe you, uh, the EPA you have to deal with. Um, if you're doing noise testing and, and air sampling, you have industrial hygiene metrics and, and rules that you have to follow. Uh, ergonomics, if you're focusing on ergonomics, there's this one there, so uh, I guess it impacts you, uh, you guys on the call a lot, you might be ISO, so following rules and regulations from audits and the structure you have to follow by. So there's a lot of different uh, uh, things that the safety professional is responsible for, but a lot of, again, it's mandatory. Here's what I need you to do, uh, and you can set up accountability programs to keep the employees on track to keeping themselves safe. Uh, but I think the one benefit of that is that having someone in an organization that has that safety background, they're very comfortable with assessments and audits and developing new policies and procedures, uh, knowing how to implement these policies within their organization and, and, and get people to understand what's expected during the training and uh, the follow-up, uh, doing a lot of consistent monitoring and uh, and being able to enforce the program, or enforcement is probably a bad word, but hold people accountable to the program. And they're really in this world of continuous improvement, uh, very skilled with relationship management and getting uh, the, being the intermediary between the management, the top management and employees, and developing and fostering that culture. So I think when you combine the safety and wellness efforts, that's the one of the strengths that you can get from the safety team and the safety department is getting a lot of that. Uh, the connectivity with, with uh, putting things in place and blending that with 
wellness activities. Um, so, so moving into, so what's, what's the case for this then? Because I think it all sounds good when we might conceptualize it. But as we mentioned right away, there's a lot of studies that are out there uh, that are starting to draw attention to some of the gaps that are missing or some of the opportunities. Uh, one study from the, uh, the American Journal of Public Health uh, recognizes that there's a lack of attention to these commonalities between what we traditionally view as the occupational risk factors, again, the responsibility of your employer, or the personal risk factors of the responsibility of the individual. So it recognizes that we don't really see anybody addressing very well or consistently the difference between when I have my employee in, my, in the walls of my business and what they do when they're outside of work. And we need to focus on both of those, as the study shows. So the relevancy of the study in terms of today's presentation is that emphasizes that uh, that now that the medical community, researchers, and health protection and health promotion initiatives are being developed, uh, the focus of, of both of these risk factors must be a part of that in order to be most effective. You, you can't just say, well, I'm not responsible for my employee and how they use their ladders at home because I, they, have a, you know, they know the rules here. You really have to encourage people to, to, to take that outside because uh, when you see these uh, injuries develop, it's it's really not much different. It's the same person we're talking about that gets hurt at work, it's workers' compensation. If they get hurt at home, it falls on their benefits. In either situation, you're losing productivity from this employee. Uh, and traditionally, a lot of these decisions have just been made on injury statistics collected through workers' compensation claims or OSHA data and other relevant sources with limited access to individual health information because of the protection laws. We have HIPAA and a lot of things that, that limit your access to what you can get from the wellness side. Uh, and again, this study, the eight personal risk factors they're looking at are some of these risk factors that, that bridge the gap, like genetics, age, gender, uh, chronic disease, um, obesity, smoking, alcohol use, and prescription drug use. So they're studying how these affects uh, influence the injury severity and type that, that might occur either out or inside of the workplace. Uh, what the study proves is that uh, personal risk factors can significantly influence the, the number of injuries and how bad the injuries are of workplace injuries and vice versa. Things that happen at work can greatly influence how severe or how often something occurs when someone's outside of work. So now we have data to back this up. It's not just a theory. There's studies out there saying, look, you have to focus on everything. An example is obesity is one of the country's uh, major health problems, over two-thirds of adults being overweight or obese, according to the Center for Disease Control. And if you can conceptualize that someone that's obese trying to do some work might have greater exposure to these injuries that require them to perform duties that might impact their joints or soft tissue injuries. Uh, so if they're lifting uh, or having to bend or, or get under uh, some product, they're going to be more susceptible to musculoskeletal injuries. They're, they're going to take longer to recover. Uh, and in turn, greater costs are going to occur from loss of productivity, from severity of injury. So, uh, you know, and again, if this injury occurs at the workplace, it's work comp. If it occurs outside of the workplace, it falls on employee benefits. But either way, you're, you're losing that, uh, that, that productivity. Uh, and just last point here, again, when we, when we look at information that's out there in data and statistics, one way, one place we look is, is OSHA for their global injury types. And we see that the number one injury type is sprain, strain, and soft tissue. The number one injury cause of strips and falls. Now, if I was, if I took the heading off here and said it came from OSHA, I think it'd be, it'd be hard pressed to determine whether or not we were talking about injuries that happen off the, off the job or on the job. So again, I, we're making the case that um, that you can't just compartmentalize things to the workplace. You need to start bridging the gap and and making sure you focus on ways to more overall wellness and well-being. Uh, and Jack's going to talk a little bit about uh, that side of it. Hey, thanks, uh, Paul. Um, one of the things I want to uh, just mention uh, before I make some comments is that 
along with the, the, the concept of safety and well-being and the benefits of all those things in terms of cost, loss state, is really addresses the number one uh, problem that, that uh, your members uh, face, and, uh, and that is recruiting and training the next generation. Um, because this really, the, the idea of impacting and uh, well-being is one of the things that leads to higher levels of, of employee engagement and attraction. And so it, it's, it's, it's also will influence that. So you'll, you'll see that as we kind of get into some of the conversation. But, but starting from a big picture, really it's about uh, uh, organizations and, and people. So attracting people uh, to safe or environments that really support their well-being is what can really contribute to attracting people into, into the industry. Uh, what really motivates people, uh, learning mastery, uh, a skill is, is so valuable. Uh, to people, really having a clear purpose and connecting with other people in their organization. So that's that's a, a really that's a part of what when we talk about well-being, that's that's what we do to support our our employees and our colleagues uh, to to achieve those things. And then and then really organizations today uh, are really looking at okay, what kind of impact are we having on our environment and uh, in our community? And so what's our corporate social responsibility? So what is not just the, the uh, a, a footprint that we're leaving, but what's our hand for it? How are we making the world a better place than what we're doing in the, the products that we're manufacturing? Um, and then that relates to the sustainability, and all these things ultimately contribute to the bottom line. And so well-being supports the concept to the people along with these other areas that I know you are really attuned to now in your uh, working and the, the kinds of uh, uh, products that you manufacture. And then obviously, uh, keeping them built in the safe environments there. To go to the next slide, um, one, one of the things that, uh, you know, these are numbers are just, you know, hard for us to really under, uh, relate to, you know, the, the, the dollars, but it's, a, it's, a, it's what we would call to a very wicked problem. It's a global problem, and it's really a competitive issue for us. So to be competitive, these are the things that we need to address to maximize our competitiveness. Just uh, um, in, in the U.S. alone, you know, 2.2 trillion lost almost 12% of GDP from chronic disease as well as work-related injuries and illness. So the combined issue around uh, safety and, and work-related and all, as well as the, the, our, our health and well-being and wellness, all, that's, a, that's a big issue for us uh, that we need to address. So if you go to the next um, uh, area, there's a lot of common risk factors. So these same risk factors that Paul was pointing out are the very same things that are the the precursors or the determinants that uh, for safety incidents as well as health risks. So the, the, the reason why we're really encouraging the conversation and the, to join together with safety and well-being is because the same things influence uh, and, and safety as they do chronic health and health costs. So it's by having that conversation together, there, it creates a lot greater value for the organization. Uh, not, to, not to mention the impact from a personal health uh, and uh, that each individual will, will achieve for themselves. Um, hitting the uh, next slide, Paul. Um, so these issues around safety and well-being, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of come down to this concept of vital behaviors. What are those vital behaviors that ultimately lead to uh, those things that can ultimately impact our well-being and, and safety. And, and, and this book, Influencers, uh, really helped me understand this concept and, and, and look at, okay, what are those specific things? So these things that listed here would be some of the key vital behaviors. So what are we really trying to encourage people to do? Uh, obviously, uh, the, the use of tobacco products and, and not using tobacco products getting daily activity and exercise, even beyond, because many people in manufacturing uh, have activity levels, and that's important to do that, but are, are they maximizing all their activity and, and what they're doing? The, the, the diet, uh, obvious things, making sure we get plenty of sleep. Sleep is probably one of the most important variables that all of us are, are not really maximizing on. Uh, the connectivity to our family and friends, uh, obviously use of seatbelt. Um, and, but then here's a real important thing that, that, again, impacts safety as well as our well-being, and that is uh, financial well-being. And many of you probably have introduced the concept of financial well-being and, and, and things that, that help people understand and planning and use of money and, and fundamentally those things. So those are 
really key vital behaviors. So we say, what are we really trying to get people to consider uh, and, and encourage them to do at the, at the workplace uh, uh, around these vital behaviors? And then uh, each year, the American College of Occupational um, and Environmental Medicine gives awards to organizations that demonstrated strong cultures of health and, and safety and health. And Dr. Ray Fabius, uh, over a period between 1999 and, and 2012, said, okay, let's, let's take those companies that have received those awards and let's look at their return on investment uh, uh, for themselves. And let's compare that with the S&P 500. And what they found was that those companies that really received those, the award, that really invested in developing the cultures of safety and wellness and well-being and health, those companies really outperformed the S&P 500 over, over a 12-year period of time. So it really shows that the concept of these culture and developing this really is, shows a return on investment and really uh, ultimately, as, as Paul pointed out, a much greater value um, on investment. And then there's this concept uh, from Gallup, and we know that focusing on employee engagement really is, is the same thing as safe, a safety program. That's probably something that maybe is thought of in some other area of your organization, but it really is a safety issue because we know that higher employee engagement or I, I really enjoy my experience working there leads to higher safety. So it looks to hear it when they did a meta-analysis, in other words, uh, analysis of, of all the current studies in this particular area, and Gallup, as one of the most highly respected uh, sources of information, found that uh, those that, uh, organizations that had higher engagement um, really were, were in the top 70 percentile in terms of safety. So impacting employee engagement is something that influences safety and also, as I pointed out, influences and, and, and attracts individuals into your companies and organizations because it's those people that are having the positive experience that probably leads to those referrals of other people. Uh, to, your, to your companies and organizations. So uh, this, this concept of employee engagement is really important. And if you go to the next slide there, the, the, it also, this employee engagement also impacts performance and well-being. We know that people that, that employees that have higher employee engagement have higher performance in the work that they do um, uh, versus those that, that, that don't. So people, so employees, six out of ten employees rate high performance when they have higher engagement versus those that have low engagement uh, uh, in, in their company. So again, it impacts their performance. The other thing that it impacts again is their well-being. Six times more likely to be engaged. So when you focus on well-being, you're focusing on engagement. When you improve engagement, you improve performance and you also improve um, safety. So it's, it's all interrelated, which again is why we're really stressing and, and, and our message today is having safety and well-being, people typically that are on different parts of the organization, having conversations together and building some commonalities together with that. Just some more um, background, just to you kind of, kind of see that there's a, a tremendous opportunity for all of us in all of our companies and what we're doing in, in organizations because, well, uh, engagement uh, is really not improved. This shows between 2013 and 2014, it's, it's really, uh, it, got, it went up to about 32% of thriving or highly engaged in 2015 and 2016 hasn't really changed. So we're, we have a heck of an opportunity. So if we want to influence our performance, uh, improve safety and well-being, we really impact employee engagement. So we really influence that. Uh, number and then as you look and see just kind of uh, in the area of manufacturing and production you can see that that uh, it, it's even less in some there and some others so particularly in the manufacturing so again if you really want to influence the attraction of the next generation uh, in, into your industries influencing engagement because engagement is, is what individuals are looking for uh, in organizations that they become part of so um, want you to encourage to be open to that uh, new uh, concept. And then if you go through, you can see uh, also here from the overall from the millennials and, and the, again the young people that you're attempting to track into your, into your um, organization that they, they have uh, um, 
just a slightly lower overall engagement level. So just a tremendous opportunity in this area of engagement. And then, and then, so how does that work? What, is, what do we mean by that? Uh, the value of caring is 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 really a, a simple concept. Uh, and uh, Dr. D. Eddington, who has done a great deal of work in the area of well-being for over 30 years, uh, largely working with uh, the General Motors as as one of the organizations uh, there, really has, has brought to the forefront that ultimately showing that you care about individuals really influences engagement. And so uh, a, a simple thing that you look to the impact engagement is just showing how much more you care about the people in your organizations and the way you do that is, is really influencing their well-being uh, that ultimately then impacts their safety and in, in, in increases the incidences and ultimately the health care costs. So again, all interrelated. Um, and then this concept, uh, the next concept is, okay, what, why, why do you think Americans uh, if you go to the next slide, Paul, um, wh wh why, do you, why do you think uh, Americans did so much better than everybody else in the Olympics? Why, why was that? Well, simple. The training methods that are provided to the athletes in America are so much greater. Even those other countries that have won medals, many of their athletes train at American universities. They're students at American universities, and they get the same benefits of training. So even even though many of those from Great Britain and, uh, and other Australia and other organizations uh, around the, the world that uh, have medals. So if you, if you um, looked at all medal costs, so ultimate training, and so that's an important variable. And, and one of the things is, as we study this concept about how do we learn to get better in all that we do, one of the things that uh, uh, this uh, Charles Duhigg that has done a lot of research in the area of, of human performance and quality and what helps people improve is taking two concepts and kind of trying to jam them together in a, in a new way. And that's, again, the message that we're saying. Safety and well-being need to be thought of as one initiative. And, and, and so taking those together and looking at them uh, in a common way really ultimately will influence things um, much greater than, in, in, uh, than, than what you've done. So, um, those are some just some basic concepts we wanted to share, and, and now I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Paul to get into more details of how we go about doing that. All right, so we all need a starting point, right? So if, if we're trying to do something new and do something different, we're trying to combine, uh, as Jack said, or jam them, the, these two initiatives together. Uh, and I think we, we wanted to, to leave you with maybe uh, just a, a starting block. Uh, five key elements that we feel that this is this is something we've put together uh, that we believe must be present in order for the, the environment of wellness and safety working together to exist uh, and, and promote its success. And these five are leadership support, uh, commitment of resources, assessment of common risk factors, uh, developing an Im implementation and communication strategy, and measuring the results. Uh, you know, the first and foremost important course is the leadership support. You need, you need buy-in from the top down. Uh, you know, we often see ideas and objectives fall short because they don't have the support. Uh, we see some of the organizations we work with, they have very motivated and well-intentioned people uh, that are in the mid-level that, that spend a lot of time putting this together, but they, they don't go upstairs first and make sure it's, it's been improved and it kind of falls apart. So that's the first step is, is focus your attention on getting uh, the, the leadership to understand the importance and then get them to buy into the benefits of integrating the safety and wellness objective. Uh, and again, reminding yourself that both wellness and safety are typically in competition for the same resources, uh, in addition to other business functions. Uh, so it makes sense to leverage the return on investment or return on value you're going to get from that combined initiative. Uh, and one strategy we always promote is, uh, is to uh, to leverage and, and, and make the case, as Jack said, to attract people into your organization, not only to retain them, but to bring new people in, and, and making your organization a great place to work so that uh, the people that work there know that you care about them, not just at the workplace, but outside. So, so using that as the, the, the unified team, I guess, is, is making it a great place to work so that uh, once leadership buys into it, 
you can move on to committing, getting resources committed to it. Uh, and, and a lot of times it's getting those champions within your organization. Maybe it's led by whoever directs the safety and wellness and well-being efforts now. Oftentimes HR is involved. Uh, or it's often successful if you get someone that you believe on your team as a, as a champion in the safety and wellness space while you direct it so they can uh, rally everybody around it. Like, there's going to be people that don't like change, and that's, that's true in every organization. So if you're trying to steer the ship a different direction, you want to make sure that you have the people in place uh, that are supporting that, that effort. And also, again, knowing what your funding and your budgets are, because nothing is free. It's going to cost money at some point. It's going to cost time, and it's going to cost money. So you want to make sure you're quantifying that, because that's also going to help you when you measure your success. So if you are investing uh, time and money into something, and you're able to show that it's had a positive impact down the road, you're only going to continue to gain support for it, or the support's going to stay. Uh, and you'll be one of the initiatives that's always going to be there. Uh, third, again, is assessment of common risk factors. So like we mentioned before, safety is going to take data, baseline data from injuries and analysis. It's going to take it from industry data, from the manufacturing industry. How do we compare from the OSHA perspective? Uh, but then you have to take the wellness, uh, whatever metrics you're, you're taking in that space on. So it could be uh, engagement surveys, it could be surveys, that, uh, aggregate surveys of what you're seeing, in your industry or, or uh, whatever is provided to you. So oftentimes as a broker, we provide some data on, on what your global uh, perspective is and what the people you have and what some of the different conditions you want to focus on. But taking that and, and maybe establishing a combined scorecard. So again, if you can baseline yourself against yourself. Oftentimes we spend too much time looking outward, but well, how do I look against other people? But really you should Start your focus on how you look against yourself as you move forward, uh, and just and keep and combine that common assessment criteria so that you can continue to build uh, some un, some useful uh, positive feedback from it. Uh, and don't don't just look at the quantitative benchmarks. Don't just look at the things you can count on and that you know we have 90% participation. Make sure you're screening and looking for the value that you're getting back in it by uh, surveying your employees and the perception of what's going on and, and yeah, getting that feedback too to help you move forward. Uh, the next is, uh, is making sure you develop a, a really good strategy for implementation, how you're going to roll this out and how you're going to communicate it to people. Um, uh, sometimes it takes some strategic and tactical planning. You might have to bring in, resource, or bring in the attention of other people in different departments. Maybe it's even the sales and the service, so they understand that uh, that this is going to impact everybody, and a lot of these uh, issues are important in, in getting their buy-in and understanding what they're going to do. And it, oftentimes, this is done very well with training. Uh, have a plan B. Discuss alternative intervention options. Think of different ways that if you try to roll it out as a group, maybe you, you think about some incentives or not incentives, but just some some guidelines that uh, you find a different way to roll out. Oftentimes people do uh, health and safety fairs to sort of introduce people to not only the services that are from the wellness and well-being side that are available to them, but also refreshing them on the safety rules. Um, sometimes you need to dip down into focusing on individual intervention. So you have the group goal, the overall goal, uh, but you design some of your more tactical approaches to influencing each individual. So focusing on ergonomics of workspaces, encouraging healthy food choices, and oftentimes vending, machine, vending companies come in now instead of chips and uh, candy, you, you have other options available to you. So you, you show that you're uh, committed to having healthy alternatives around not just focusing on getting employees to bring food to the workplace that's healthy for them. Uh, you can do competitions. We see that a lot with. Uh, weight loss competitions. Uh, you can pair that up uh, with, with some of the other uh, traditional safety-related goals or competitions you have with no injuries uh, for the week or for the month, and, and you might get some sort of incentive on it. Which brings us to the incentive program discussion, uh, which is 
you got to be careful with the way you design sets of programs. I think uh, if you were to ask Jack uh, directly a question about that, we'd say that it really depends on your culture. Uh, uh, if, if any of you have done uh, incentive programs in the past, you know that you have to incentivize the right thing. And the safety end of it, it's got to be behaviors or or actions, because if you start incentivizing, over incentivizing numbers, people try to play the game, and sometimes it leads to under reporting or not reporting at all, which is not what you're intending. So, uh, but incentive programs can be effective. Uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act um, on the wellness side is has recently established regulations for employers in providing incentives for participation in wellness and well-being programs. Uh, many of you might already be aware of it, but if you're, if you're not, and if you're interested, let us know and we'll send you a summary of these guidelines uh, after the presentation. Uh, but there are some, there's, there's some accounts out there of great uses for incentive programs and successes. Uh, one book we have here, Green and Ice Cream, uh, provides some excellent insights on how positive rewards and incentives uh, can create that culture of safety, uh, not just you know, focusing on the absence of injury, but just trying to create an overall uh, environment for a good incentive. And, and there's some reasons for that. Off-the-job safety injuries account for one quarter of healthcare costs, but a lot of wellness sites don't necessarily address this. And we saw that, again, earlier from a scientific standpoint in that one study we talked about, that this is uh, coming at it from a different angle. And 64% of employers offer, they do offer incentives between 50 and 500 and, and another 20% above 500 for people to participate. So they are, people are investing in this. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's got its pros and cons, but you know, it's something that you want to make sure that you, uh, that you have a plan before you roll out. So good implementation and communication of how it's going to be rolled out. And lastly, you have to measure your results. You have to be diligent on um, keeping your benchmarks, uh, comparing data that you baseline yourself on with what's happening this current year. Uh, it's, the, it's one of the most important ways to continue to get leadership support and also know where you, what direction you have to go. I know uh, in manufacturing, a lot of you are involved in a continuous improvement process. So you're not uh, it's not an unfamiliar idea to you that, that you have to continue to measure and, and correct and, and continue to, to make changes, sometimes on the go. Um, so using a combined scorecard can help and, and not being afraid to make adjustments where necessary and to continue to look out to, uh, to other studies or, or like us with the, with the broker people that are working with this day-to-day -day with other organizations to get new ideas. Uh, this is definitely something that's continuing to develop and there's no one right way to do that, but there's a, a lot of positive ways and effective ways to move forward. Uh, and that will lead us into uh, Jack talking about an actual case study from one of our clients where they have had some success both integrating safety and wellness. Hey, th thanks, Paul. I just going to spend about the next five minutes kind of going through one, one uh, a case study of an organization. Although they're not a manufacturing company, they have a really diverse workforce that I think is reflective of the kind of people uh, that, that are part of your organizations. Uh, the, the company is the Terracon Engineers and Scientists. And if you go to the next slide, um, it's a consulting engineering um, uh, company, uh, employee-owned. Uh, they really are environmental and, and uh, geotechnical materials. 140 locations all over the country, 3,000 employees, but half of their workforce is really in the field, and they're and they're they're really in the construction uh, area uh, of drillers, and and so they're they're really out in the field moving around, um, and, and so that it's really a, a, a active workforce, and and so when they started out the next slide, they really had an issue uh, that that really brought their attention was safety. And so they, they started safety and, and really reinvigorated their safety um, uh, initiative for their people because of, like most organizations, it's a, it's a big issue for them and it became certain, you know, incidences uh, happen and things and say, hey, we got to re reinvigorate ourselves around that. The other thing is that they said they got really high health care costs. And so they, they said, okay, how do we address both of these organizations, both of these initiatives together? And it's really the common thread was, okay, we have care and concern. We want people to come to the work healthy, and we want them to leave healthy, and we want them to be healthy when they're at home and just to thrive at work and while they're away. And so ultimately that leads to well-being. 
And uh, one of the things that guided them, and this is a resource for you if you go to the next slide, to help guide them understand that what, what do we mean by well-being. And, and so um, Gallup, when they did research, where they, where they researched people, 98% of the world's population really, uh, it says these are the things that, that uh, really lead to a person's well-being. You know, do I have a really clear purpose? Do I really have a uh, uh, good relationships? Do I have financial uh, security? Am I physically able to do the things I need to do at work and at home? And then am I connected to the community? But so, so they, they, their human resource committee and, and their safety committee really combined uh, and to review the uh, concept around this, this well-being uh, for them so they could really address the total well-being and really got together all the providers of safety and, and all the insurance providers and everybody together and just said, okay, we're, we need to focus on this as one, one area in our organization. And then they, uh, if you go to the next slide, you look and say, what are our values? And so they really said, we need to add to our values safety, along with safety, client service, quality, growth, employee ownership, and financial success, ethics, and integrity. We need to add well-being as, as to that. And this was, this was really a survey when he, they asked the, uh, uh, initially uh, the, the employees how important did they think this was to them. You can see the, the, uh, the percentages that came back to them. So even though it was a new concept that was introduced, 92% of the employees really saw this as a, an important initiative uh, along with safety. And then as they looked at the strategic pillars, they established their, their pillars on the next slide where it really uh, helped them see um, uh, that the care and concern and all that they're doing, everyone goes home safe every day, well-being of employees and their families. So it's not just about the employees, it's about their families. Because when you contribute to employee well-being, you're really contributing to family well-being. You get the engaged workforce, and then the, the, the success is really improved safety culture, uh, well-being culture, and, there you can, and people can achieve their career growth and development, and, and that ultimately leads to the fullest potential for each person uh, that leads to higher levels of engagement. And so how they accomplish that really is very similar to what Paul, if you go to the next slide, what Paul was, was citing in our strategy is that, that the, 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 really the, the, the most fundamental uh, responsibility is everybody goes home safe. They have an opportunity to positively help employees and their families love their best. The culture is care and concern, and it's really good for, for Paracon and their families. But then they did have to commit to resources, so they really needed to provide people uh, there. So they really brought on a person that was responsible for employee development and well-being that worked very closely uh, uh, in, in with, with uh, safety and uh, really established uh, ambassadors just like in safety around the company uh, and that were representative of, of all these initiatives and, and really built build out the, their reward strategy and encouraged uh, them to participate in these initiatives and then had a tremendous uh, communication effort uh, uh, that particularly as they were owners of their own organization that it was really uh, they had their future in their own hands and, and so it was really important for them uh, to build that out and then ultimately uh, was, was branded by the, the uh, a scorecard uh, and a dashboard that was made available uh, if you go to the next slide Paul that uh, really looked at, uh, really the, the cost of health care was one of the things that they look at. They look at the top risk factors and they look at incidents of injury uh, and, and, and uh, in, uh, incidences of, of injury and then their well-being and then employees. So these things, so when Paul talks about how do you really look at this as a combined dashboard, you just take the same metrics that you're using and start looking at them at one, one dashboard. So if you share that same data together with safety and well-being, you're going to be able to combine and, uh, and, and see how you can help each other in, in impacting those metrics. And so this is what uh, Terracon did and then, and then really uh, branded this together as the last slide uh, points out, really living your best life and that's really around all those domains of well-being. So that's, that's a, uh, an example of one uh, client that really pulled this together and looked at it uh, as, as a common initiative, safety and well-being together. So uh, we're, we're at a point of really um, opening out any, any questions or comments that anyone has. I think we'd like to uh, um, let you uh, do that now if there's anything um, 
that you have uh, are are they um uh, uh or or you can type those into your uh, message board there. Again, I think um, uh, if you're interested in, in anything to do with, with some of the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act incentive guidelines, you can uh, email us uh, for that um, information. We'd be happy to send that uh, along to you. All right, and if you have any comments or questions along the way, if perhaps you uh, you go off here and you want to you know, send something along, we're happy to support you in, in your initiatives of what you're doing uh, in the area of safety and well-being. So um, if I don't see I don't see any uh, additional questions here, I just uh, want to make uh, one final comment, and I'll turn it back over to Paul to uh, kind of close us out. Is that this is a, this concept? If you don't do anything else but just have your safety uh, person that's leading safety, uh, and maybe the person that's doing wellness together, have them sit down and and have a conversation together. Maybe it's already the same person. Uh, that's doing that, but really combine the making the conversation. They can really come to some common ground uh, there, and, uh, and that's really what we're encouraged to do. So I'll turn it back over to Paul, and you can close this out. All right. Uh, well, like Jack said, uh, I think this is just uh, an opportunity to take whatever you you feel you've uh, uh, taken or learned from this, or if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to call or email us. Uh, we would love to help you out. Um, uh, and we still don't see any questions that came through, so I think we'd like to thank you for your time this afternoon. I really appreciate you spending your, your hour with us, uh, and hopefully have an opportunity to talk with, with uh, one or all of you sometime again in the future.